I'd like to introduce everybody to Mr. Alligator. Say hello to Mr. Alligator, everyone. Hey, hey everyone, nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, how are you feeling today, Mr. Alligator? Well, I'm feeling a bit nervous, to be honest with you, Hamish. <laughs> Why are you feeling nervous, Mr. Alligator? Well, you see, it's very important to contextualise the use of a new technology. Otherwise, it just seems a bit weird. <laughs> well, we don't want you to seem weird, do we, Mr. Alligator? So we're going to contextualise you. You're right. I'm always right, Hamish. <laughs> so, here's Mr. Alligator, as you saw him. Here's Mr. Alligator, as I see him, uh, in the virtual world. And I'm going to go into detail about how that works. But first, target audiences. So I'm thinking a bit about teenagers wanting to make amusing videos on TikTok. I'm thinking a bit about uh, kids wanting to make bosses in Roblox. I'm going to have a little export to TikTok, export to Roblox button. But there's another target audience that I have in mind for this, um, and it's very important to me, uh, but it's a bit hard to say. It is parents telling stories to their children, or caregivers giving, telling stories to their children. Um, and I want us to spend a little bit of time thinking about this situation versus this situation, where you've got a child on their own watching cartoons on television. Um, might not surprise you very much to hear that I'm going to conclude that this one is a bit better. Uh, however, this thing has stuff to recommend it. For example, it's a minimal investment of time by the parent to put their child in front of the television, obviously. Um, yes, thank you, mass media. Um, parents only have so many hours in the day, they've got their own lives to lead, they've got washing up to do and so on. Um, on the other hand, for the other thing, uh, the child feels loved <laughs> when, you read, when you tell a story to them because you're spending time with them. This girl's smile is not entirely about the story that's being read to her. It could be some different story. It's, she's smiling in large part because her mother or her caregiver is spending time with her. Okay, there's another advantage on this side as well, which is that Cartoons and video games as well are made by animators with the ability to make impressive things happen on the screen. Uh, whereas, you know, storybook doesn't really work. My dad used to tell me stories of Harry the Bicycle, which he made up from his head. Um, and I had to use my imagination. There's a lot to be said for that, but it's certainly more impressive to see a cartoon or a video game. On the other hand, parents have an edge in terms of entertainment value, which is that the story can be tailored to the audience. The parent knows the child's mood. They're seeing how they're responding to the last thing that they said. They know which bits they're likely to enjoy. They know how to make jokes land, that sort of thing. And the claim is that my thing could do the best of both worlds. You get all of these advantages. Um, to say the elephant in the room, though, here's a very lovely image of a parent interacting with a child. And if I put a virtual reality headset on that, <laughs> like the one I've got here, everybody knows that there's something wrong with that. But this is a question of technology. The technology is marching onward. You will eventually have a headset more like this, where she's just wearing a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> Nobody can really object to that. OK, so to paint the picture in your head, the parent is in virtual reality. They make a cartoonish character that they can interact with. They also have an external display, such as the one that I'm presenting to you on. Here it's a television, could also be a tablet, and the child watches them make the cartoon characters and tell the story, and thereby a good time is had by all. Um, an extra nice thing about this is that uh, when the parent has got to go and do other things, they can Potentially, I'm going to make an app to make it so that they can export their cartoon character to uh, an app that the, chip, the kid can play with on their own. And then next time they meet up, the kid can say, oh, I did this with the, the cartoon character. Tell me a story about that. Um, and so we can have this uh, return to a charming old world where people are making the toys that their children or the children in their community are interacting with. This is part of the idea. Um, I want to point out an extra advantage of the artist being present with the audience, which is to say the parent being present with the child, uh, an advantage that it has in comparison with cartoons and video games. So questions get raised and can be answered by a child. 
so here is a picture of actually me, this is me at the age of 10, and I'm showing my younger brother my Lego helicopter. And he has the ability to ask me questions. What is a helicopter? What is it for? What does this bit do? How did you make this? Very important question. He can learn from me. In fact, he likes learning from me because he likes me. <laughs> um, he likes me, and so my being with him uh, stimulates his imagination. That's the idea. And to make a very obvious statement, you don't get that with a cartoon or a video game. You don't have Walt Disney standing there and ready to answer questions on how he made Mickey Mouse. You don't have Shigeru Miyamoto or somebody from Nintendo ready to answer questions about how a video game got made. Um, so you know, you've got art forms like <coughs> Lego, origami, uh, playing piano, uh, cooking. Um, in all of these cases, children can ask their caregiver uh, how, how does this work? How can I learn more? Well, and thereby learn more about this. Um, doesn't happen with these things, which is sort of to the detriment of these art forms. The claim is we can have something like that with these art forms if we are idealistic enough, let's say. <laughs> um, and let's face it, children do really like these things. They like video games and cartoons. Here's a problem. If you want to make something in 3D, even a really crude thing like Mr. Alligator I was just showing you, if you want to do that today, you've got to use Blender or Unity, and these are ridiculously complicated pieces of software, hundreds of buttons. They are essentially made for uh, professionals, people who have a degree in using pieces of software like this. You know, this, this interface isn't even showing, it's not even the whole thing, because people tend to get like arrays of hotkeys, and obviously you've got to learn to code if you want to use Unity. Um, I had the experience of being a small child and downloading a 3D so like 3D software in the late in like 2002 or something like that. So it wasn't very good. Um, well, I was really put off. I the, the world almost lost a computer graphics professional on that day. I had to get back into it uh, when I was about 19 because it was so complicated. I was like, I'm never going to be smart enough to use this thing. And that's even more going to be the case for a parent. Even if there was a parent who wanted their child to learn to program, who wanted to stimulate their kid's interest in video games, um, they can't do it. It's too hard to make these things. So speaking of, I'm now going to show you how I made things like Mr. Alligator. Now let's say that I want to make an animation of a thing with an eye that can look around. So here's my eye. It's very easy to make. It's just, uh, I've got a paint button here. And now I've got the theater stage on which you were seeing uh, Mr. Alligator. So I can add a pupil to that eye. Um, and what we want is to make this eye follow this point around. That'll be a fun thing to see. So how are we gonna do that? Well, number one is going to be telling the computer in some sense where the eye is. So going to put that here, and you'll see that I'm doing this sort of Street Fighter Tai Chi hyper <laughs> There's a very good reason for that. Um, all right, so now I'm going to make, this is a point that I'm making that's very, very far away. That is the point, that's the direction in which the eye is looking. Sorry if that's a bit uncomfortable to watch there. So we've got the point where the eye is, we've got the point very far away where the eye is looking, and now I'm going to do this with my hand, and I'm going to press, a, and I've made this sort of line, and I'm going to press a button which makes it so that you can see this flat flashing line here. And now if I let go, we've got a line. This is the line that connects that point we made back there with the point that's over here. If I grab that point over there, you see this line moving. All right, let's say that is approximately the quote unquote line of sight of this eye. So what we want to do again is to make it so that the eye is, tra is uh, tracking this point here. So I'm going to do, oh, I'm going to do um, make another line, and here we go, we've now got two lines. And the claim is that the eye should have the pose that is that takes it from looking in this direction to looking in that direction. So I'm going to grab the eye now, and I'm going to turn it in the way that I want it to go. Fairly intuitive thing to do. Now I press my snap button, and it recognizes it's making this line flash and this line flash, and here's the rotation that I want, so I let go, and now, We've got the eye following a point. That was freaking difficult. Yes, I deserve this applause. This is like so much work. <laughs> okay, let's make it a bit more sort of cartoony and fun. I'm going to make it a pirate. 
because that explains why it's only got the one eye. We've <laughs> <laughs> got a pirate. I'm going to have some faster tools for making this kind of thing pretty soon. All right, and we're going to have an eye patch. There we go. And we're going to have a, let's have him have a little tongue sticking out of his mouth. He's blowing a raspberry at us. Uh, out of his mouth. Could give him some gold teeth or something. A thing that would be more fun to do would be, let's make it so that he's looking at something. So we've got, we're going to make a fish. This is my little tribute to Brett Victor, whose idea this significantly is. We've got a fish. And let's have an eye on the fish. That makes it look more cartoony and fun. Uh, people for it. So here's our fish. We want the uh, the pirate to be looking at the fish. So let's make another point with our Street Fighter Hadouken pose, which uh, is going to be the point where we want the pirate to look at on the fish. We move the fish. We make another point, and this is the point that it's been moved to. And now I grab this point. I press my snap button, and it knows what to do. So now, look, we've got a pirate that is following this picture. It doesn't look great, but thank you very much. All right. So I've been making all of these geometric objects, these points, these uh, lines, rotations. You can also make a plane, so there's a plane for you guys. Um, and as I make all of these, they are being added to a spreadsheet, <laughs> because I think that spreadsheets are great. So in this spreadsheet, well, what do you do with a usual spreadsheet? You have a bunch of numbers in the spreadsheet, and you do things like adding, multiplying, dividing them, whatever. In my spreadsheet, the things that you're adding to it are not numbers. They are geometric objects. Again, points, lines, planes, uh, rotations. Well, spreadsheets are well, more well suited to me, because they call up that image of doing simple mathematical operations with numbers. Except I'm just doing it with, I'm taking the square root of the ratio of two points. Sounds very strange, but it does, it turns out, make sense. And now you might ask, if this is workable, if spreadsheet animation is a good idea, why haven't we seen it, a version of it from these large companies who, you know, after all, they've got a lot of money uh, that they put into pushing virtual reality. They certainly put a lot of money into animation interfaces. And... There's a very, very clear answer to this, which is the approach that I'm using, where I'm doing things like taking the square root of a rotation, it really belongs to something called geometric algebra. Um, in particular, something called projective geometric algebra, uh, which was discovered by a guy called John Selig here in London only 25 years ago. Um, and the way that these companies do uh, computer graphics and animation, they love vectors and they love Euler angles and stuff like that. And if you say, well, they made, if you say to them about geometric algebra, they'll sort of say, oh, well, uh, maybe in our R&D department working on super complicated AI stuff, we'll have some geometric algebra. But no, certainly not for the front end of an animation program. We're not going to have that because it's too complicated. Euler angles are much simpler. Something like, for example, a quaternion. Oh, man, no way you're going to get an artist, let alone an eight-year-old, to understand quaternions. Because from their point of view, a quaternion is a complicated data structure. It's something to do with a point on the surface of a four-dimensional sphere. This is bullshit. <laughs> quaternion. It's a line. It's got an arrow curving around it. Done. That's a quaternion. <laughs> Once you can think about quaternions and other things, you can think about multiplying a plane by a rotation, taking the ratio of points. It turns out to be very intuitive because you first learn it by doing the gesture, and then you see the code that's put into the spreadsheet. It turns out that all of these things are very intuitive. Quaternion multiplication, taking the square root, exponential, whatever. Um, these other data structures that I've got in here, these companies are working with them. But again, they think of them as these very complicated things. Um, and then, dual quaternions, so only Disney and Crytek uh, use these ones. They're like, oh, they're crazy. They're so simple. They're rotation, translation, done. All right. This has been Snappets. Thank you very much for listening. You can contact me this way. I also stream every four times on Geometric Algebra. I'm also looking for people to come on board.
and invest. I'm going to run out of money eventually. Um, thank you all so much.